Welcome to Book Babble. I am, as always, your host, John Hartness, and joining me, as always, I said I was always too early. Oh well, fuck that up. Oh, you're you're always yourself too, though. That it, I am always my, much to my chagrin. Yeah. I would, you know, there's a lot of days I'd rather be John. I'd rather be George Clooney. Why? Well, he has a funny name. You could be a better Batman. Oh, um, yeah. You know, I've never <laughs> seen him and Batman in the same room. That's true. So, welcome to Book Babble. I'm Batman. <laughs> I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Melissa MacArthur, who is the associate publisher of Falstaff Books. And tonight, live at Atomicon, well, live to tape, at Atomicon 2019, joining us is Christopher Rocchio, who I'm very happy to have finally learned how to pronounce his name. It's all right. I, I was saying earlier, uh, only one person's ever gotten it right first try in my life, and I dropped my phone. Wow. So thank you, Ann Sowards at Ace Books. <laughs> um, I heard that story first thing this morning. That, yeah. That's a great story. I, yeah. I said it twice today, sorry. That's okay. Uh, She's great. I, I met Anne this year at Dragon Con. We did a, we were, I was on a panel yeah. with her and Claire Eddy, and I was intimidated by the fact that I was way the worst editor on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> she is really great. I, uh, I almost went with Ace Daw, preempted me, uh, I, but I did go, I went out of my way at Dragon Con to go meet her once. Yeah. So, cool. Such a star. So speaking of Daw, Tell us about your books that they publish. All right, so, well, this is book two in uh, my series. It's called The Sun Eater. It's a space opera set about 20,000 years in the future. Uh, main is character. it also 20,000 leagues under the sea? No, no. It's at least 20,000 leagues up and out, though. All right. Oh. So, you know, there is that. Uh, it, uh, it's about a nobleman who runs away from home. He gets stuck in the middle of this war between human empire, the first aliens who have ever stood up to us in all that time. It tells you page one. It's written like a memoir. Uh, that he's the guy who ended that war and killed all the aliens. This is why and how and about all the things no one knows. Uh, I like to say he's like Anakin Skywalker if becoming Darth Vader were his best possible choice. <laughs> uh, and, and so I don't have book one with me. Book one's called Empire of Silence. This is Howling Dark. I gave, Those titles are awesome. Uh, thank you. I, the covers are also great. Yeah, they are. I, I have been here looking at it. I have been very blessed in that department. The third one uh, is Demon in White. I just turned it in. Uh, and it's going to be out July next year. I'm trying to do one a year so that uh, uh, no one gets mad at me. So that'd be July 2020? 2020. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Now, that's a serious book. How many pages is that? Uh, pages, I don't know, uh, but it's 260,000 words. It's, All right, uh, it's about so, 700 pages. Okay, so to, here on Book Babble, <clears throat> Go for it. we use a unit of measure called a Sanderson. 250,000 words equals one Sanderson. So you're like at 1.05 oh, yeah. Sandersons or something. All right, that's a respectable space opera. That's pretty serious. It is still shorter than every Game of Thrones book, which is, which is what I'm trying to do. On the back here from Library Journal, it says, this wow book, book is a must for fans of Pierce Brown and Patrick Rothfuss. Well, all right. I have the first book. I haven't read it yet. I picked it up at Dragon this year because I wanted to read the book that won the Manly Wade Wellman Award this awesome. year. Congratulations. Thank you. I had no idea that was going to happen. That's really cool. Uh, I have Sam uh, Samuel Montgomery Glenn just called me and was like, hey, so uh, don't tell anybody, but you won. <laughs> uh, and I was like, what? Didn't, isn't there someone else? It doesn't. Uh, dude, I did the same thing. Don't David Drake and, and Orson Scott Card live in this state? Uh, did, you, did you forget him? About them? I don't think yeah. Card. I don't think Card released a book last year. I don't think he did either. But you know, I'm and I don't know if Drake did or not. Your award though is super cool. Drake did. Okay. But See, I do him. have the my Manly Wade Wellman Award plaque will be forever the coolest Manly Wade Wellman Award plaque. The year I won, I won for I won largely because Gail Martin had three of the five finalists, so she split her own <laughs> vote, and I managed to sneak in under the wire. And I'm fine admitting that, and I'm. I'll just own it, but I won for the very first Quincy Harker novella, which is called Raising Hell. So my award says the Man North Carolina Speculative Fiction Foundation presents the Manly Wade Wellman Award to John G. Hartness for, for Raising, Raising Hell. hell. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> that, is, so, that is very cool. That, I look up at that every once in a while like, I am an award-winning hell raiser, <laughs> bitches. <laughs> I guess you fitted for the spikes. Right, that's what I was just thinking. We did we that at Congregate. They um, they put horns. That was I was did a makeup demo for them, and they glued horns to my head. It's my, it's it was my Facebook profile picture for a long time. Awesome. People were just like, I don't see anything funny about that picture. 
it's just it's that it's, it's real just, life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You and took your makeup made, off. You yeah. made people pitch. I did. I I made people pitch to me while wearing the double horns. It's oh, we got they're all the there. Submissions in the email today. I file mine <laughs> down. Yeah. yeah. Like like Hellboy. Yes. All right. Now, you also have a book related day job. Yes, yeah, I am. I'm in a bit of a strange place. I think I might be the only one um, in traditional publishing in, in this exact spot. I'm published by Daw, but I am junior editor at Bain. Okay. Um, I, uh, I've been interning for Bain for about a year. I started in January 2015. Uh, through NC State, they had a, an internship program with the English department. And uh, I, I backed into the job because uh, I was watching, like, oh, that person's not going to last the year. Uh, so my internship ended in April, and I was like, what if I just like stay over the summer? I'll work for free, like one day a week, you know, half day, whatever. I'm like, oh, sure, if you want to file stuff, whatever. So I hung around, and, and, and my evil scheme paid off in January. Well, I got, did some temp work, and then in January, they're like, hey, do you want the job? You've been hanging around long enough, and, and, and uh, you know, Megan's uh, leaving. Uh, I was like, ha ha, gotcha. You know, <laughs> that's so how you get a job in publishing. Yeah. Is yeah. You kind of hang around until, and by attrition, there's no one else left to hot, get hired. Yeah, so I, I've had a couple of people who are like, how do you get a job in publishing? Like, you just wait. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There aren't that many. There's, fair, it involves you know. arsenic and patience. <laughs> uh, I can't confirm or deny that. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, so then the Thursday that same week, I sold the books to Daw because I'd been working on the whole uh, querying process. I wasn't sure Bain was going to hire me. If they didn't, did I want to work with them? I'm kidding. Uh, you know, but I, I really did. I wanted to keep the two halves of my life sort of separate, just because I didn't want any accusations yeah. of nepotism. Of course. Um, and yeah. says the guy who owns the press that publishes the majority of his work. <laughs> there are no accusations of nepotism. Modern problems require modern solutions. There's no um, accusations of nepotism in my career. It's fucking true. No, well, yeah, I kind of own these things. Right? Um, but I didn't, you know, I didn't want to do that. And this way, too, no one's hectoring me about my writing at the day job. And none of the people are like, well, Christopher, you've uh, been writing too much. Why, why is your work sliding? So everything, everything's separate. Now, this does mean that I, I work, like, you know, 10 hours a day, if not more, um, trying to get this done. Because these are not short. And nope. I may only have five readers. It's a little more than that, but you know, I, well, we I know I, Samuel I, Montgomery Flynn's one of them. I yeah yeah yeah. I uh, I don't I, I don't want to end up in uh, George Martin's position where everyone's mad at me. Yeah. I do want to end up in his position in every other respect, um, except I want a cooler hat. Um, yeah, but you definitely but, want to get to the point where people are not cosplaying your characters at cons. They're cosplaying playing you, right? Yeah, well, it's yeah. What the is why you need a distinctive look, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, you you got that. Yeah. I'm working on it. Yeah. Uh, I don't write vampire stuff, but, um, you know. Well, I mean, look, you've only got three books under contract, no. right? I mean, your career's young. Yeah, never never say nothing. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, so, yeah, so I, I've been keeping the two parts pretty pretty separate. I do some uh, anthology work for Bane. Uh, okay. One of the things Tony likes to do is keep uh, old short stories in print. The short story is a troubled medium, generally. But Tony feels a cultural obligation to keep some of the classics of science fiction in print, which I think is awesome. Yeah. Um, we will reprint, uh, we were printing all of Gordon or Dixon's stuff right now. A lot of that had, had cycled out of print. And y'all have reprinted a ton of Heinlein. A uh, ton of Heinlein. Um, a lot of the stuff that people don't think about, like Not Stranger or Nunes of Course Mistress. But, yeah. But like the juveniles and some of the more obscure stuff of all the 2100. Things like that we keep in print. Tony's a huge Heinlein fan. Yeah. Um, but uh, I do some of the short story stuff. We did a collection called Space Pioneers. Uh, last year it came out. It was all pioneering stories, obviously. Okay. Um, most of them reprints. They let me slip an original story in each one because they're not paying me to edit it because I get a salary, but you know, but, may you as know, well write something. Throw you a bum. So that it's just not a book that I'd do anything with my name on it. But we found like a Paul Anderson story that came out in 57 that never been reprinted. What? Well, it's called Third Stage, and it was awesome. Uh, but it had been in, I think it was anal, uh, not analog, but whatever it was at the time. I don't think it was analog yet. Amazing, still astounding. Mm. Too many A words, I get confused. Um, the they Campbell one. And uh, and it had never been reprinted for whatever reason. So we find these gems sometimes and we, and we bring them back. Uh, that's dope. Which is super cool. Um, now, so what's the name of that one? That's Space Pioneers. Okay. I'm doing another one. Excuse me. Black Sabbath. Um, I, uh, so... Uh, uh, I did an, I did another one called Overruled. That's uh, reprint of legal stories, uh, Ooh, fun. courtroom stuff. Uh, 
and we're doing another one called the Cosmic Corsairs. It's going to be all space pirates. Ooh. Ooh. So, uh, Ooh, fun. We do things like that. The really fun thing about that one is we've got Don Mates to do the cover. He yeah. famously did Captain Morgan, right? So Tony was like, who do you want for the pirates one? I'm like, do I have to say it? She's like, this is not funny. I'm like, it's hilarious. Yeah, it's um, brilliant. It's, uh, yeah, and it doesn't look like Captain Morgan, but it's... But he does, does he at least have one foot off the ground? Uh, he does not, but one of them is a robot peg leg. Uh, I'll take it. So, I'll take it. It's pretty cool. <laughs> that is awesome. Cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited that I just turned in my first short story that's going to be in a Bane anthology. Which one? They don't tell me everything. I'm doing, I'm doing a story in the Liberty Con Charity anthology oh, cool. that's coming out in 2020. So, yeah, I just turned that in to... It's going to Chris Woods first, and then it'll go to Tony Weisskopf. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm excited about that. It's my first published work by Bane. So that's fun. It was a... Uh, it's an original Quincy Harker Demon Hunter story. Cool. All right. Well, welcome <laughs> to the fold. Yeah. I know. I've, I've now... This is the third new publisher that I've put a, given a short story to this year. That's awesome. And I haven't done shorts for people for a long time. I'm doing a run of them right now. I just turned in Demon in White. So I'm sitting waiting on my editor. Um, and rather than do nothing, I've written five short stories the past couple months. Nice. Um, so I've got a couple more I want to do and then should have revisions by then. So. Very cool. So other than badass old school short stories, what have you been reading that you really love? Reading? Uh, well, I am actually, and this is super weird and narcissistic, but I'm listening to the audiobooks of my first book because it's been a minute since I looked at it and I wanted to, I wanted to refresh. So I did that on the way down here, um, working on it. But I had, uh, I just read, um, I just lost his name, Robert Hugh Benson's Lord of the World, dystopian yeah. novel from 1906, 1908. Ooh. Wow. Um, it's. Um, it was sort of a rebuttal to H.G. Wells, because uh, H.G. Wells is sort of a utopian socialist, mm -hmm. and, and Robert E. Benson was a, uh, a very conservative Catholic priest, um, and he you know, looked at Wells talking about how oh, everything's going to be great, science will fix all of our problems, and he's like, well, maybe not all of them, right? Like, there's probably some problems there. So he ended up doing this very like Orwellian story um, about this guy who is an American senator who uh, ends World War III and is acclaimed Emperor of China. It's 1906. There was an emperor, right? Um, by acclamation. And then is given the presidency of the European Union, which he predicted in this book, and becomes Lord of the World, which is a, uh, one of Satan's monikers, right? Uh, and so he's essentially the Antichrist, but he brings about this utopia, and everyone thinks everything is, is fabulous. And... Um, and, but there are still problems underneath because he starts persecuting different people and making them disappear. And to the degree that it prefigures Orwell, it's really fascinating, and it's been it's been overlooked. But I, I uh, was reading some news article, and both of the last two popes were like, "Yeah, this book's super cool." I'm like, "Well, if Benedict and Francis could agree on something, that might be worth reading." So I, I checked out. It's, it's very bleak, um, and I don't usually go for dystopias, but it was it was fascinating. Um, and he's one That's of those really weird, like, really early sci-fi writers, and he's one that nobody uh, nobody talks about. There are a whole coterie of people who are uh, Wells and Vern contemporaries who've just vanished. Yeah, I've never heard of him or this book. Super and obscure. I, I took a course on dystopian literature in college yeah, a, it's, a million years yeah, ago. Yeah, it's really, it's really obscure. It's in public domain, though. It's on Gutenberg. Uh, that, cool. I think that predates um, Zamyatin's We, too. I, I think it does. Because I think that was, uh, after, I think that came out after World War II. Uh, I, I mean, so. World War One. Uh, it's either the 20s or the 50s. Twos and fives look the same. No, it was definitely because um, Zamyatin predated Orwell. No, yes. Yeah, so and yeah. Huxley. So, yeah. yeah. It, it, but I think that's even before that. Yeah, so. it, this is pre-World War One. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's got a very different look at uh, at, at uh, global politics, um, and it's it comes from a very different world order and a, and a, and a philosophical conception. Um, I really want to read that. It's very good. Um, it's very now, good. what's the name of it again? Uh, Lord of the World. Lord of the World by Robert Hugh Benson. Robert Hugh Benson. All uh, right. There's also it's on Audible too. Uh, hey. So Simon Vance read it. He's one of my favorite narrators. Um, That's really cool. Very cool. All right. Well. There you have it. So after you've bought Christopher's books and absorb and like completely consumed those, get out there and pick up Lord of the World yeah. by Ro Robert, Robert, Hugh Robert Hugh Benson that um, I'm never going to remember. That is okay. Well, you can watch the footage. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's amazing having I'll put it online. I could put it in the show notes. You sure could, yeah. 
I'm not going to remember. Link in the description. I'll remind you. Yeah. T don't forget to mash that subscribe button. <laughs> yeah. I really hope that's the If you enjoyed the video, leave a like. And, yeah. I really hope that's the last time I ever say mash that subscribe button. Well, we already just won't. said it again. We're Southerners, man. We can say mash buttons. That's, that's true. That, dude, I used to be a lighting Although designer. I'm like a half-breed, right? My, my dad's from New York, so... And so, where were you born? Like the Aquaman of, of Southerners. I was born here. All right. But Aquaman was born You mashed land. potatoes. No. Dude, I was a lighting designer for 20 years. I mashed a lot of buttons. <laughs> Press buttons. Or if no. it's on a, on a computer, I, I, you click them. Yeah. I know. I was really pissed. I Not mashed this part of the world, oh, well. friend. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Well, All right. thank you for spending a few minutes thank with us. We appreciate yeah. you. And we will talk to you all later. Bye.